911. Hi, this is Pat Claire with Oakland Hills Country Club. Yes. Could we get a fireman out here? There's smoke, not like wood burning. Okay, we'll get somebody over there, okay? Thank you, thank you. Hello and welcome to Building Together. I'm Leo Savoy, and this program is the first in a series of conversations I'm hosting about the construction of Oakland Hills Country Club, which was a historic loss to the community when it burned down to the ground in February of 2022. Oakland Hills has been an instrumental part of Bloomfield Township going all the way back to 1922 when the clubhouse was first built they had their first major there the western open and oakland hills has been involved with golf for uh 100 years now six u.s opens there three pgas several u.s amateurs and a Ryder cup oakland hills has been known uh, nationally and internationally with, within the golf community the rebuilding of the club is a unique project that demonstrates the collaboration required among bloomfield township Oakland Hills Country Club, the designers, the architects, skilled trades and builders, as well as community members. I'll talk to them all in the months ahead, but today we'll start with the emergency response to the fire that leveled the building. With me are Bloomfield Township Police and Fire Chiefs, James Gallagher and John Leroy. Welcome, gentlemen. Tell me what was going through your mind when, uh, uh, when you went, showed up on site. It brings back a lot of memories. That scene, the way it started, was not a fire. It was didn't come in as a fire. It started as the odor of smoke in the building and in the uh, bakery area. So it's it was, you know, we've had we've been on other responses just like that in Oakland Hills. You're thinking in your mind it's it's the normal, you know, somebody burned something in the in the kitchen and uh, we're gonna find it real quick and and We'll be on our way for the day. That was uh, far from the case. Yeah. And would you have initially just one crew show up there? Um, it got dispatched as two stations, or th actually uh, three stations because of the odor of smoke and uh, command. And uh, when they were en route to the scene, they got a little bit more information. But uh, Station 3, which is at Maple and Telegraph, showed up, and they went inside. And they had an odor with very little haze in the building or anything like that or no signs of a fire and they went to the area that was reported which was down in the basement which was down in the basement and it was like the furthest point from where the fire truly was but they spent the next over 30 minutes or so on the scene attempting to find it and every time they would come up from the basement or go in a different part of the building they were getting thrown different different signals that something is going on here and how about you, Chief? Uh, it took me when, when the call first went out. Again, we've been to Oakland Hills numerous times, uh, both the police and fire departments on various runs. You know, it's an old building, right? So, um, you know, while it's updated technology in the building, you still get false fire alarms there. And it, so it's not uncommon. Um, but I remember, I, I think it was uh, Lieutenant Leitz that was on scene um, as, as one of the first uh, commanding officers inside the building. And you could tell in his voice that. Something wasn't right, um, and there was a little bit of frustration almost. Like, we can smell something, but we can't find it. Um, and I remember at the time I was a captain, I went down to our, our police chief at the time, Chief Langmire, and said, you know, I'm going to drift towards Oakland Hills. They're reporting the firemen are smelling smoke down there. This this doesn't seem – something's not right here. That's not normal that we go there and smell the smoke, right? So uh, when I got down there, you know, it, again, there was no fire yet. Um, it was just you, – you could tell something wasn't right, but – and even though the club was closed down in, in February, it was still occupied and yes. members were still using the fitness facilities and and whatnot. So walk us all through what, what you had to go through. Uh, uh, there had to be a lot of concern um, in the early moments. There was. Um, I was coming from Madison Heights at the time and listening to the radio, all the radio traffic that was going on. And, you know, I was drifting that way, but it wasn't like an emergency in like an emergency or at that point but as you could tell in the in the radio traffic 
it wasn't right. D didn't like what I was hearing, and I upgraded my response to emergency to get there as quickly as possible. And the conditions gradually worsened over time. Smoke was put began appearing more and more. Um, and in a building of that size, the smoke really is deceiving. A little bit of smoke can mean a big fire in a building of that size because the smoke has such a great big area to dissipate over. And as those conditions got worse and worse until they finally found the fire, um, it was very stressful. And in finding that fire, you'll, uh, you'll see the, the flames just shooting out of the back of the building. But having been involved with um, uh, Leo Chartier, Dave Piché, uh, Mike Morin, those, those are all the uh, three previous fire chiefs before you, and every one of you have said that our two biggest fears um, of fires in Bloomfield Township was uh, Kirk in the Hills and Oakland Hills because of the age of the building, the size of the building. Oakland Hills like, was about 95,000 square feet. So now suddenly uh, everybody's aware that this is a catastrophic event. Your men shut the roads down and... Uh, yeah, it, you, you knew right away um, when, when I got down there and, and again, when you went to the back side of the building along the, the uh, first tee there in 18th Green, there was smoke coming from, starting to you know come from underneath some of the roof and uh, you knew at that point. And I, and I had obviously grown up with the fire department guys here and um, that this is the one building and we didn't know what was inside those walls. Most of it was probably paper insulation. So we knew that if something ever got into that building and it was a conversation from the police side that you'd hear the firemen say all the time is the one building that cannot go up in this township. I think it was the second oldest wood structure in the, in the state at that time. Right. Um, was if it gets into the attic of that building, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and you could see the concern. And, and I, it was shortly after I got there that they upped, upped this to a, uh, which I'm sure the chief will talk about, an Oakway response, a multiple, multiple agency response. Um, and that's when we knew from an agency perspective on the police side, one, we have, we have there's a lot of uh, emotions for us for, from employees in this place. Oakland Hills, it's an icon here. It's a, it's a landmark here that's, when, you, when we first hire on, it's one of the first places they take us. Um, Kirk in the Hills um, is one. Temple Bethel is another, um, and and you know Oakland Oakland Hills, and so the, the history that's in that building for all the employees and um, is you, you knew this was going to be bad, and it, it literally just brought officers and employees from the township just because of the concern and what can we do? But we knew this was going to be a multi multi day event once this we we as it progressed. I think another thing maybe we'll touch on a little bit is talking about the weather that day. The the, the weather was cold windy, snowy. I don't think it got much above 10 degrees, did it? It actually was a tale of three seasons. Yeah. It started when, really the, when warm. the fire started. It was about 45 degrees and just cloudy to a driving rain to a severe snowstorm. To It was a but it was windy 10 all, degrees yeah. by the nightfall. The, the wind was something else. And yeah. once once the fire, you know, it, and, and I think they'll show some uh, B-roll at some point in here, but once you see the fire, it multiplied. And when the fire department talks about a fire multiplying, the, the wind took this from that the main center part of that structure in about 40 minutes, that entire building so, was up. So you, you mentioned Oakway, and uh, Oakway is an alliance between about, what, 14 different communities o right now? 11 full-time fire departments in our area um, with their do uh, fire and EMS together, and we really, truly are as close to one department as you could possibly be. And so that allows all the communities to to rely on the other ones for equipment, manpower. You know, equipment is is big. How many ladder trucks do you need within a a small regional area? Um, but how many how many departments showed up on scene that day? I believe we were up to 16 or 17 departments, uh, all the Oakway departments, and then over the course of the day and into the evening, once we needed some relief, we called in uh, a different Mabus division from the northern part of Oakland County to assist us for a few hours that night to give our crews a break. Yeah. It was it was pretty, uh, the biggest fire that we've ever had in Bloomfield Township um, in both size and the number of people required and, to. And probably one of the larger ones in the uh in the state of Michigan, like I said, it's, uh, this was built in 1922, and it's basically, although it's a commercial operation, it's designed as a residential structure, and in fact, it was 
uh, when it was first built, it had living quarters above the uh, uh, first floor so that when people came from the city of Detroit, members came from the city of Detroit, they would spend weeks on end in the summer uh, out at Oakland Hills. And the type of construction was probably the biggest hindrance to the fire that day, or the biggest, it helped it advance so much. It was what we call balloon frame construction, Mm -hmm. built in the 1920s, and balloon frame means that back then, trees were uh, bigger, more plentiful. They they would cut the actual uh, boards the length of what they needed. So it was one two-by-six or exterior wall uh, stud that ran from the foundation all the way to the attic. Well, what that does is it allows the fire to go right up that chase like a chimney and go right from the basement to the attic in one with no, without nothing in place to slow it down. So you mentioned Ed Leeds being first on the scene there, and I had talked to him uh, um, a little bit later while the fire was going on, and he said, I really thought that uh, we had it contained when it when it broke through, when we realized where it was, um, put that out, and then they opened up the ceiling in the living room area. Yeah. Uh, what happened was is once they knew they had the fire outside when uh, they opened up the exterior and flames came roaring out, then they started looking a little further, and it was already in, it was in the ceiling above the fireman's head in the... Uh, in the, I believe it was the dining, the hall, dining area. hall area. It was there, and then it was already in the attic on us. And it really was a tale of two fires. From the back side, we had no idea, that, or from the front side, we had no idea that on the back of the building, it was as involved as it was. Up front, I'm seeing gray, wisping smoke. I'm thinking the suppression system is holding this at this point, giving us a chance. And Lieutenant Leitz is out back telling me what he has, and we're trying on the roof to vent it, cut holes in the roof, and and really get this thing, or at least confine it to a smaller area. And he asked at one point, can I come around front to for a face-to-face? I, yeah, he came around front. He looks at what I'm looking at and goes, oh. He's like, you got to go around back. And I went around back and was, oh. <laughs> and no, I was there with you, and so you saw that, and just a look on your face. And... Uh... So you had the roads shut down, but uh, part of it was all of the uh, all of the hoses that were spread out over Maple Road, um, getting the water. Uh, how many millions of gallons did we end up using? Between ten and a half and eleven and a half million gallons of water over a four-day period. Yeah. So once uh, those hoses were laid out, you can't bring rescues over the top of them. You can't bring uh, trucks over them. I don't know about cars and whatnot. Uh, No. So a lot of your people and your people are kind of stuck there um, until you can uh, figure out how how you're going to reconnect all of these. We had to get some ramps out. We have special hose ramps, they're called, that can go over the hose, but we don't keep them on the truck. They're very large. So we had to get a couple of different sets from neighboring organizations to really allow for some movement of apparatus in and out of the scene after that. And then to compound it all, um, water mains were breaking. We, for the first time ever, sucked the entire system dry on the south end of Bloomfield Township. Yeah, we it, it drew response from even other police agencies, and obviously bordering ones, but... There was law enforcement agencies, obviously Oakland County, between our, our village police department, Franklin Village and Bloomfield Hills. They all just came knowing that that the magnitude of this fire. Um, I mean, we had people calling from, you know, other east side departments or police departments saying, you know, the chief's calling. What do you guys got going? We can see the smoke from, you know, from over here. And um, and then when you told them what it was, it literally drew and. and a crowd of officers in um, just to see what they could do to help. And, you know, I guess I'll throw in there too, as you mentioned the other fire chiefs, uh, obviously Chief Chartier doesn't live in the area anymore, but the other fire chiefs uh, retired, responded to the scene to lend whatever help they could to give during this fire. And the amount of retired firemen that showed up on it, you know, and just while well, they can't, they don't have the suppression system or, or gear that they do now, but they know how to pull hose. They know how to, you know, provide whatever necessary things that are just another set of eyes from their experience that they could provide back to that incident command that's invaluable but it just shows when you go back to talking about what oakland hills means to bloomfield township but as an employee as well what you you said it it, there's no it's irreplaceable really and 
and that's really all part of the show, how all of these departments come together, because you had police and fire, and that was the start of it that day. And then you uh, fast forward for the investigation for both police and fire to really make the determination as to what caused it. But you also had the uh, uh, water and sewer department. They were there because, as I started to say, we drain the system. And when you drain the system, not only does it impact the system itself in terms of water main breaks, it impacts all the residences yeah. around the area and the amount of water that, that they can get. Um, you have the building department uh, immediately involved. You have engineering immediately involved, and then you had all of the um, um, all of the charitable organizations uh, uh, that was there. You showed the uh, the one of uh, the Salvation Army pulling up there, and as you said, these our guys were out there for 10, 12 hours without a break, and then once they could take a break, and you bring another shift in. Uh, they were on site for, for four yeah. days. And you got we, we threw the weather in there, right? So you started off as a nice day, but about I think it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the weather took a turn, um, and, and we got several, I think we got six to eight inches of snowfall yes. that night um, during it, but you also then turned the parking lots into ice, so our DPW was down there. Things I learned, I've never been, I've been on a scene of a lot of fires with these guys, but I've never seen fire trucks run out of gas, yeah. you know, on scene, and having a tanker trucks, gas fuel trucks, having to come pump fuel into fire trucks so they can continue to pump water. Yep. You know, just the, the operational aspect of this was truly um, amazing, and, and not an amazing way that it's this fire. It's just how many moving parts. You had our dispatch, uh, obviously, at, at the station, and um, my, you know, the police played a role in this of, of um, directing traffic and, and maintaining crowd control with, with people coming. But you obviously you're in inside with your dispatch center, but food. Bathrooms, porta potties, things like that that people don't really think. Well, of the facilities, yeah. a warming station where the firemen could go because it was dropping and they were, you know, soaking wet in that weather is all those operational things that we have to think about. Uh, in Maple Road, it has what thirty-five thousand cars a day, yeah. and so when you shut it down at Lasher, when you shut it down at Telegraph, uh, now you have everybody being rerouted yep. there and. Uh, I mean, the community isn't used to being rerouted there. So the police department was as taxed as uh, anybody yep. just taking care of the peripheral situation. And I, I think an invaluable resource from that day was what the dispatch center did. From You have that incident going on, so you basically have one dispatcher that's responsible for that incident. But the rest of, you throw a winter storm in on top of it, the rest of business in the township doesn't stop. We have to find a way to fill, backfill those resources and get more resources in from neighboring communities. We have a storm that comes on. It makes I-75 a skating rink. Um, a number of accidents from the police side still still occur. Your rescue still have to get we, out we, there. We have having a barricaded gunman for an hour in the evening, yes. um, you know, from an so, armed robbery in another jurisdiction. So the dispatchers <laughs> really were in, over the course of the, that 24 hours really it was comfortable comforting knowing that i could make one phone call or one call over the radio and things got done you know you asked them could you, hey can you look into this next thing you know whatever you asked for it showed up and they were responsible for really taking care of that yeah. and the community was so supportive overall in terms of uh uh, getting food to you guys and, and whatever you needed, whatever resources that the business community and the residents had, um, they were calling in and uh, it was at your fingertips for, uh, uh, for the period oh, of yeah. time that you needed it. Yeah. It was amazing how fast food showed up. Plum Market was one of the first, uh, you know, and, and we, I'll give them a shout out there. I think Belfour, um, you know, and Savvy Sliders were on scene within, you yeah. know, two, three hours. And I think it was truly an Savaggio was another one. They could have been sent, yeah. sent in restaurants, sent, yep. sent stuff yes. down there. And so when you look at it two years later, and it, it, that's why I think it's so important to chronicle what is going to occur because this was the start of it. But then the within the operations of Bloomfield Township, once you get done with the investigations, you have the design review board, you have the zoning board of appeals, you have the planning commission, these are, uh, and you have the township board, and these are all 
public boards where the public can speak and voice their concern. And uh, you said it's irreplaceable, but in reality, it, it's not. We've spent the last two years coming up with a plan. It's going to look almost identical to when it was built back in 1922, uh, even with some sloped roofing that had gone away um, um, with the additions over, over the years. Um, and it's going to look like an old building uh, with all of the features that, uh, um, that the fire marshal is going to require that the building codes are going to require the engineering, the, the water resource commission. We're now all dealing with uh, underground water uh, detention so that uh, uh, the water doesn't uh, overflow when heavy rains come in. It doesn't overflow and take, take over the systems. So this is just the first start of uh, acknowledging all of those things and it all focuses here in Bloomfield Township. Um, it's uh, it's where it starts uh, from the time that you guys showed up until the time two years from now when when it's open. Yeah, you know, one of the hardest parts of that day, I mean, yeah, the building's coming down, was standing outside talking to the membership that was showing up and, and reminiscing about their parents' wedding, their grandparents' wedding, their kids' weddings that were all in this building, um, and the history for those families that, that meant something, yeah. you know, and they, so they were losing a little piece of their own history with they, it. And I feel the same way. I started there at 13 uh, um, in 1968, 1969 as a caddy. And then I became a busboy there when I was in, in high school. And uh, years later, I was thrilled to become uh, a member of Oakland Hills. And then I was extremely honored to become president of Oakland Hills. So it has a lifelong affiliation yeah. with me just by virtue of when I started there and, uh, and, and still, still there today. It, uh, this is a complex reconstruction and uh, it takes all of the resources between architectural, building, uh, builders them, themselves yeah. to really bring it back. Uh, we've got major tournaments still coming up. Even this year, I know that you guys are working on uh, on the uh, junior USGA Junior National, where people will be coming in from primarily around the country, but uh, around the world, it's an international tournament. And we've got women's U.S. Opens coming up. We've got uh, men's U.S. Opens coming up. Um, so there are just a lot of things over the next 15 years. But what I found most interesting when I looked at the fire and I looked at uh, um, where the damage was, was the north end of the building, the pro shop, that's the newest end of the building, and the fire stopped there. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the construction, we're in there, it stopped there because it fell under the current uh, fire code, or the most recent one uh, uh, prior to where we are today. Yeah. So you had all the fire blocks and things like that, and it basically shut the fire down. It gave us the ability to hold it back and not long enough to get the crew when the crews were inside to stop it at that wall um, and at that point we had enough crews on on scene the resources available to really stop it and give us a, a chance at that point and I, I just to pick you know talk about it is I remember uh, you know lieutenant Leet's been there trying and you and you guys talking on the radio clear I remember it like all right you know, we're using the two chimneys as a, as a base point on the on the main part of the clubhouse. Let's keep it. Let's try to keep it within this range. And unfortunately, that I, I, that wind picked up. And um, but I think one thing we, I don't know if we want to touch on though is that the, also the fire department being able to recognize when this building was going to be a loss and and risking, you know, re recognizing the history that was still available mm -hmm. and going in there and, and um, setting up almost a assembly line of handing out yes. things that we try. We, they, is memorable it, for Oakland Hills. You no, know, they, they did that, and I, I saw the front portion of it. Um, I don't know if there was any film of that, but uh, things were coming out the front door, things were coming out the window. Where the fire hadn't spread at that particular point, how can we save what we need to save? That, uh, uh, that really, those are the items that become irreplaceable. Um, it... Um, in the big scheme of things, it's not that significant, but uh, uh, you were able to save quite quite a bit of memorabilia that would have just gone by the wayside. 
And one of the things I, I think we need to credit from a, from a law enforcement perspective and in, in dealing with the membership and stuff outside was that, and I remember you specifically saying it, it's a building. Yeah. In the end, at this large of a building, nobody's been hurt yeah. yet. Nobody's, nobody was hurt yep. at all. And nobody, it, and it really was, I mean, a blessing that day because even we didn't even have any slip and falls mm -hmm. where, where personnel got hurt. Um, I was probably the only one. That at about three o'clock in the morning, I went, I hit a an area that was under construction and nobody saw it. But I went, <laughs> I went slipping and sliding. But really, nobody was hurt, and that was the the whole goal. Once you go to a defensive fire like that, that is your whole goal. Is it's it's things we can't replace people, and to get nobody hurt, nobody killed, and make sure that everybody's safe moving forward. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to add in closing? We're excited for the future. Yeah, it's, and, it's, it's and, exciting to come back. And I know we're going to have you back on here because we're going to talk about the different departments, uh, the building department, uh, might be the fire marshal there. Uh, one of the things that are going on is basically building an underground road under the tee boxes on the, on the backside to support a fire truck because you couldn't get your equipment right. back there. Um, and in order to get the proper coverage on a building like that, let's knock on wood. Hopefully we never have to uh, uh, face this again. But if we do, the uh, structure itself will be in a much better uh, position uh, yeah. to protect itself or allow our people to, to protect it there. Yeah. So I, I want to thank you both for coming in here. Um, like I say, I think you'll be uh, back in here as we progress forward because I'm, we're to. going to take it. As you said, uh, there's a hole in the ground now. The retaining walls are up there. The tunneling is going on. And slow but sure, the steel structures will be going up. And uh, we'll be talking along the way. 2026 will be here soon enough. All right. Hey, thank you very Thanks much. Enough. Thank you very much. Take care.